I love Africa. When I was 18, I took a year out before between school and uni, and I went. I chose. I went to Africa for five months, and I backpacked through Africa and got a lot on the local buses. And where did you backpack through? So I did go with a Gap Yar company. Um, where initially, so which I was 18, so you I went, went on your own then? No, so the, initially I went out with a company that took sort of a bunch of 18 year olds and we went to Swaziland okay. and we did like a six week project where we were helping to build a school and you know yeah, kind of doing some community thing, yeah. things and it was great and I, you know, I loved it and we did some activities and things around Swaziland and loved Swaziland, beautiful country and then we travelled and then we did six weeks of like play so we we went we sort of we where did we go we went to Mozambique and we went and learnt to scuba dive off the coast mm. and we went to Zambia and we did we went across the salt flats and did sort of cool activities and safari things we went to the Okavanga Delta mm. and we finished up at Victoria Falls mm. as a group and I was one of those crazy ones that did the the bungee jump off the Victoria Falls Bridge. I was 18, it was crazy. I was 18. Um, Would you do it now? No, no, absolutely no, no. I, was, I was shaking when I came off it. I did not enjoy it. it was a red, I'm terrified of heights. It was pure, pure peer pressure. And so if we finished up there you as a group. You were totally red, in it? Yeah. So yeah, we finished up there as a group. And then, and then we kind of went off into little smaller groups. So with a few of the friends, we then went off and we'd been three months in Africa at this point. Then we went off and the last two months was us just doing it ourselves and getting on the local buses. And um, and so I went through uh, Tanzania and up to Zanzibar, went through part of Kenya, and then went over to Uganda and, and spent a little bit of time in Uganda. So this was in, when was it? It was 2003, I think it was 2002, 2003. So Uganda had only recently come out of out of war and genocide mm. you know it was pretty horrendous like you could only travel to certain regions, certain regions we're sort of in sort of the Kampala area and you can I remember one point it was like we wanted to go and see the Murchison Falls and go and see well there was like meant to be these amazing monkeys in this sort of in this forest area and then there was like oh no there's a local um, militia, militia attacking some villages up there at the moment you can't go I mean it was kind of quite um, you know for, you know, for coming from the UK, it was sort of like, oh my goodness, like, this is something... This is real, man. This is very real, yeah. <laughs> this is not the movie. No, exactly. But I did experience some corruption when I was out there very directly. And I remember being in... I think I was, it was Lusaka. And we were getting the tra about to get the train. And we'd had our passport stamped. We paid our visa, which was like 50 US dollars or something we had mm. to pay as a foreign traveller pay our visa and I was standing there with I was like two girls and two boys we were you know looked you know wide-eyed innocent um, from England and one of the guards came over you know with his rifle and everything going, can I check your passports please and we we're like yeah checked our passports and he goes you don't have the right visa and I was like no we do these are the right visas we've just paid for them I'm like no you don't um, can you come to our office and so we got taken off to this sort of back room office and there were four guards standing there with their guns and they basically were like you know, it wasn't they weren't threatening us but they just sort of stood over us going you each need to pay an extra 50 dollars each us dollars each and and i was like starting to like no we don't like quite kind of no we don't one of the boys was like hannah we're just paying the extra 50 dollars each and i'm like oh okay so we just <laughs> paid our extra 50 dollars and walked out and that was you know we were an easy target for them just to yeah. get some extra you know you're not getting on that train unless you pay us an extra 50 us dollars and i think when i went to uni I, you know you learn that Actually, for a lot of people that work in, you know, as police or a lot of the sort mm. of civil services jobs in Africa, their pay doesn't cover yeah, cost like, of living. It they it's expected. Five a day, it's like yeah, it's expected that they take extra handouts, like that they'll get extra bribes, that they'll do that. It's almost just a culture that's, mm -hmm. you know, go milk the tourists. It's okay, off you go, kind of thing. It's, well, it's not just a tourist; it's every and anybody. Yeah, but I, there's always always room for negotiation. Yeah, I, I think I was 18 and yeah. you know, I was like with them with them, <laughs> sat a bit intimidated. And I was like, okay, I'll just pay the 50 US dollars, which was quite a lot of money to me then. I, because the first thing I had, I said, no, I'll give you $50 or, or we'll give you $100 between the two of us. Mm. I said, reason being, because we won't talk about this on the BBC and name you. Yeah. yeah. And then everybody's happy. And besides, you're going to get another tourist come through in the next five minutes. And the longer we talk about it, the more tourists you're missing. Yeah. So how about you just take this? And they go, ah, okay, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so going back, that's very interesting about your time in Africa. What was it like in Swaziland? What did uh, you get I loved up it. To? So I think what I found very 
challenging in Swaziland at the time. So Swaziland is still one of the few nations where there is um, a king, king yep. and he has multiple wives. Yeah. And Did you at, see the ceremony? No, I didn't. Oh. But at, at that time, he would still take, most years he would take a new virgin 16-year-old as a wife most years. So he had a lot of wives. And it was almost a joke in Swaziland that everyone's a princess because there's so many kind of yeah. children of the royal family in Swaziland. Um, what I found really struggled with at the time was that culturally, you know, the king was everything and you didn't say anything against the king. He yeah. was, his word was absolute. And at the time there was an American, and they were Christian, and he was an American preacher, was was in the US and he was doing healing seminars. So he would get everyone into a stadium and he was laying his hands on people and healing them. And it was this American preacher and the king trusted him so much that at that time he was sitting the king had invited him to sit on his sort of government panel and you know to sort of advise the king and you know i was just like this guy's a complete crook he's a charlatan because he was doing these mass aids healings and yeah. anyone who was hiv positive yeah, he was okay. laying his hands yeah, on them and healing them and it was all over the papers when we were there and i remember saying to we'd got on really well with some of the guides that were taking us out when we would go out um and do sort of big treks and things like that and i remember just being like i can't I saw on the papers, I can't believe it. And this, we'd been all really chummy and then this guy just looked at me like, but the king is right. Like, you know, he was sort of horrified that I'd said something yeah. against the king. And I sort of quickly kind of had to shut up. Did you realise yourself or did someone have to tap you? No, I realised with his response. Like, I didn't realise, I think at 18, just being like, well, obviously this guy is a complete crook, like saying that he can heal you by putting his hands on you if he's got, if you're HIV positive and then allowing these men to go marry their new little bride and they're yeah. HIV positive you know I was kind of horrified with my yeah. western education that yeah. this was happening and that the king was endorsing it but as soon as I said it, I could see yeah. like the look on the faces of mm. the people that you know you can't criticize the king but and I like just that, was like it's like that in many places in the world oh yeah no I, I knew but this was my eyes were open I didn't it's the know. ultimate leader kind of thing yeah so what were you you said you're building houses in we did like a series of two-week projects so one of the two-week projects you know we were paying we turned up at these villages and we were paying and then we paid money into the community so they kind of hosted us gave us a sort of a novel activity to do which was you know we actually did two weeks of we helped to build a small a lot of the kids in one of the village mountain villages we were rent to they'd never seen white people before a lot of the children they were like hiding behind bushes like looking at these sort of white yeah. group of backpackers coming through <laughs> and we had one of the girls in the group was she was black british but she's jamaican heritage okay. and everywhere we went she just got so fed up because everyone would start speaking to her in local dialect right. she's like i'm not african they're like oh you're african girl and she's like no i'm not i'm actually jamaican if you really want to know like and they're like <laughs> they're just, it would be so funny but she used to laugh about it the whole time yeah. but she's like everyone thinks i'm african she goes well, i probably am I'm, you know ultimately but you know yeah. she just um, used to laugh but, uh, but in the main, it was just, you know, mm. yeah, opened our eyes to a whole different world and different cultures. And, and you know, I learned a lot um, that I would never have learned else, elsewhere, so. What would you say is the key life skill that you learned when you were in Swaziland or any of Africa? I think a lot of it was just growing up in independence. Like, I think if you're a kid growing up in London, you grow up a lot faster than a kid in the countryside in a different way. Mm. But just, we had to, the good thing about this, you know, paid money to do it, but the good thing about this gap here was that we were kind of, one of us was put in charge each each week, or a couple of us put in charge. We had to plan the menu, we had to go and do a food shop for the whole team, there were 16 of us in the team, and, you know, have a budget. You had to organise and go to the train station and get everyone's tickets, plan out the route. So it just, I think there was a lot of life skills that actually it was a great experience to do. Um, just just growing up mm -hmm. um, and not having mummy and daddy sort everything out for you. Mm. But then there were a few hairy situations, you know, like that situation where we, you know, we were kind of yeah, told, yeah. you know, the money, which I've never been in a situation like that before. Mm -hmm. And then also I, you know, met so many interesting people. And I remember when I was, we went, we went to Uganda, we took the bus to go and to see the Mountain Gorillas. Mm -hmm. And we got on, me and sort of the boy, I was, traveling with at the time we got on the local bus and we'd gone about an hour it was a 10-hour bus journey we got about an hour and somebody stepped in front of the bus and killed themselves and we had to sit on the side of the road middle of nowhere next to this 
this dead body. And everyone on the bus was so matter of fact, this just happens, this is life. Mm. And for us, it was like, oh my goodness. And we waited for a replacement bus to turn up. So by the time we set off, we were really late. So by the time we got to this mountain village, it was deserted and there was nobody there. And there's normally somebody comes and meets people, any backpackers that are off the bus to take them to kind of the backpacker accommodation up the mountainside, as it were. But I'd been chatting to this elderly gentleman who'd been in Kampal uh, for visiting family. And he was a security guard in one of the very posh, safari, um, posh sort of safari lodges that were up in the mountains. And I'd been chatting to him all the way and we just, you know, had a really nice chat about his family. He was, he was really interested in the UK, hadn't met anyone from England before. We had, you know, just got on really well. So when we got there, he just turned around and said, come with me, I'll give you and James a, a bed for the night. And we were just like, we didn't know what else we were going to do. So we sort of put our trust in this man and he was absolutely wonderful. Get Kicked a couple of his security guards out of their beds, gave us a bed for the night, and then got one of his guys to walk us up the mountain to the backpackers thing the next morning. And we swapped addresses and we were pen pals. And he was about 70 and I was 18. And we were pen pals for about four or five years. And he used to send me photos of his mm. life in Africa. And I think it just taught me about speaking and being friendly to anyone you never know mm. and being sort of when you might need someone to help you or you they might you know you can help someone else and mm. it just yeah just I think those kind of experiences stay with you don't they mm -hmm. what have you learned from your time in Africa that you wish you knew when you had started probably to not put my opinion straight out there because I had opinions and I thought not necessarily I was right, but I had had my education and upbringing and thought that everyone would probably think like me. Mm. And actually, just because people have, you know, different, different backgrounds, educations, experiences, cultures, religions, it doesn't mean that your opinion and thoughts are the right things. You know, you, should, you need to listen first before you put, open your mouth and give mm. your perspective. And I think that there are certain people that will welcome challenge and it's recognising when it's appropriate to do that. Mm. I think I probably went in a little bit, how can you think like that, you know, just because I was do 18 you, and... Do you think that's being brought up in England? Do you think that? Because the um, reason why I ask you that, is when I first came to Africa, keep in mind I was there for about 10 years, mm. moving around that region, I found over time, so I had, I had businesses there. I had mm. a gym, a car hire, a fleet of tip tips and a clothing line. I was mm. employing up to 85 people mm. at its peak. And I found that I had a very English mindset. Mm. And it's like, why would you do it like that? No, we do it like this. You mm. should do it like that. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, no, this is, they make it work for their culture, their ways and their, f do you see what I mean? And then yeah. later on, I just learned to listen, watch and observe. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Sort of not going, jumping straight in, thinking that I was sort of right or, you know, giving my opinion too quickly and actually just sort of listen and watch and mm. and learn because, as you say. Going back to that bungee jump. Oh, furthermore, you spoke about the, the person being hit in the car mm. by, by the truck or coach or bus. Mm. Did you have any other situations like that where you're just like, this is, this is, how, it, this is how it works out here? I think there were a few things that, we, I remember we had one experience where it was just a bit, in terms of feeling a little bit intimidated or kind of realising how we were being perceived. So everywhere that we'd gone, in the main, people had been incredibly welcoming and friendly. And, you know, a lot of it was, you know, there is an element in Africa of everyone's trying to sell you something, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and you kind of get used to quite quickly. Someone would be chatty and friendly to you. And then they're like, oh, my brother has a safari business. Do you want to come and do safari with us? And you're like, were you only ever chatting to us just to sell us the safari? Mm -hmm. Were you actually interested in us at all? Mm -hmm. Like, So, you know, but everyone in the main was very friendly. And I remember when we got to Lusaka, we went out the, into sort of the town for a meal. And um, I remember we sort of, there was sort of a, a very much a locals party that was going on in a sort of square and there was lots of like food market stalls that you could get your food from and there was like music and and so we went and got sort of stuck in and would like buying some food and dancing and we were the only foreigners we were the only tourists there um it was very much a local party in which we didn't really kind of think anything of because we just thought it was an open you know we we're in the in the city town and a few of the boys went to the loo 
and in our group and a group of guys came in pinned them up against the wall and they all pe got peed on and they got told you're, this isn't a tourist place you're not welcome here like mm. and and that was as bad as it what got in terms of being peed on I could you know could have been mm. a lot worse and we were quite quickly sort of shoved out and I think it was just that kind of mm. you know so they've, had, they've had bad experiences with tourists probably well just yeah exactly just also realizing that you're just you don't have a sense of entitlement just you can go anywhere do anything you want mm. and everyone's always going to want you places you know it's yeah. I kind of get it you know yeah, I see it. I, I sort of got it from their perspective. It wasn't a nice experience, but it, I sort of got actually maybe we just sort of turned up with an assumption that we were welcome and you know always welcome. <laughs> they could you know have been I mean? having a cultural festival. Well, I yeah, just saying, yeah. I, I sort of get it. You know, just made just being a little bit more yeah. aware I'm... about how we looked and in terms of just sort of these. Um, tourists and these sort of wealthy British people kind of just swarm, swarming into our local party and thinking that they can dance and have fun and eat I, the food and do yeah. what they want. Oh, not even asking if you're... If we were welcome yeah. to come in. We just yeah. didn't, we just assumed yeah, it was, yeah. you know, we were pe we bought food and stuff, we just assumed... Didn't you have a, a, like a guide or a chaperone most of the time? So we did for the first, so that the gap year company that we went with, they had two guides, essentially, because we were a bunch of 18 year olds. And and then after that we went off and backpack. And I think that that was you know a good thing to do. I think to to have mm. gone out and just suddenly got on all the local buses and mm. backpacked around Africa at eighteen is quite. I don't think it's foolish. It's just quite a brave thing mm. to do. And I think having done it as part of a group with a couple of guides mm. initially, mm. sort of just mm. gave us you know some skills in what, terms of thinking. And what made you want to go to Africa? And what did your family say? That six months is a long time to be in Africa. Yeah, and it was back, you know, there was no smartphones. And I, I think the first time I called home, I'd been out there for five weeks. My parents hadn't heard from me for five weeks, and I just called home on a payphone. It's Hannah, come quick in! It was a little Hannah, bit are you okay? Are you alive? Are you <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I was very fortunate. My family have taken me on lots of holidays internationally and stuff as a child so I had done a bit of traveling we'd we'd gone to Cape Town once which is amazing but yeah. not Africa um it's very much a bubble that's yeah, yeah. not really yeah. not really uh wouldn't really Joe Berg's different though yes and I and Joe Berg I had it was Cape Town that I'd been to and I'm very conscious that Joe Berg is different um and then we'd also my stepdad had spent 10 years in Kenya as a teacher when he okay. was in his 20s and he took us out to Mombasa and That's to the coast. To yes, we flew and he went. We went into Nairobi, Mombasa, and then went out onto 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 the coast and uh, for a week. So we'd done a kind of nice and did a safari holiday. So we'd done like a very you know, nice posh version of a Kenya, you know, holiday as it were. So I'd kind of seen enough of it to know that this was this huge continent that was just fascinating. And loads of my friends were taking a year out between school, and they were going backpacking in Southeast Asia and getting drunk in Thailand on full moon parties and going and getting drunk up the coast of Australia and I just thought no I don't want to do that I want to do something different and I want to to have an experience and see something different so I found this company that did this trip and also you could learn to, to scuba dive and you went you know, did some safari you did some that was some fun things that you did mm -hmm. um and i just thought you know what, i think i'm going to learn so much more and get so much more out of this experience than just going to get drunk in thailand yeah. backpacking you're probably definitely right how was the gorillas in uganda oh it's probably one of the most single most amazing things i've ever done it was a really last minute decision to go to uganda because it was at that time still a bit questionable about the safety of uganda and we went into the, we turned up in Kampala and went into the office that sold the visas because they only let a certain number of people go and view the gorillas. Yeah. And it's incredibly expensive. But at the time they'd had a couple of Americans cancel and we could buy their visas a little bit cheaper. So it was still about, I think it was like 180 US dollars to get the visa to do it, yeah. which is why we got on the local bus and got out. So it was a lot of money back then. You know, it was yeah. like me spending 450 pounds now, which at 18 was like a huge amount of money. But I kind of knew it was... Once in a life. Yeah. And we kind of went, there were sort of two families that had been of gorillas that had been i guess conditioned and used to people being near them yeah, and but it was them again. yeah literally <laughs> and it was in the wild so we set off there was um, me and this friend james and another 
back as an American couple. And we set off, and we had, I mean, we had two guides, and then there were four, four guys with um, AK-47s um, with us because two years before, a group of German tourists had been but massacred by you know, the, the fighter gorillas, as it were, mm. um, up in the mountains, and they'd been killed with machetes. So it was still that dangerous in the sense that there was a lot of people, a lot of sort of, you know, it was on the, you know, it's on the Uganda-Rwanda border. So, so we went off and you, they, it was amazing. We, it took us about, I think, four hours of walking before we found them. And yeah, and there's nothing around. You're just there, standing there, and there's a silverback gorilla about 10 metres away from you. And Don't you're told... Him you're told like if he charges you do not run you stand your ground and you're like oh my god <laughs> but you know you have like other there's guides and other you know people there with you but it's yeah it's quite amazing seeing them that up close and sort of just coming across them in their natural environment like that it was quite special <laughs> okay so your heart it was a memorable moment and your heart was beating yes absolutely okay so was there a way, when you approached them, did you have to bow your head? Did you have to put your hands out? No, well, you didn't get that close. But it was still about, I'd say the length of this car was about as close as you got. But we kind of... That's close. It's really close. For a guy who could rip your arms off. <laughs> yeah. Do that and both your arms come yeah. off. And That's really we were close. close. And it was very dense vegetation between us. So one of the guides was like quietly just cutting a branch of a tree so that he could pull it away so that we'd have a clearer mm -hmm. view. And, and I remember this silver pack had his back to us, not far away from us, his back to us, and just munching on something. And this guide was slowly sawing off this branch of the tree next to us. And then once he'd broken it, he started to pull the tree branch away, like it was like a bush branch, like away, so that we could get like a clearer view so he wasn't so obscured. And this gorilla just suddenly stopped munching, turned, looked at us, grabbed the end of the branch, the other end of the branch to the one that the guide had, yanked it out of the guide's arm and just went <laughs> at us. And it was so close that I was just like, <gasps> like, you're just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, yeah. it, man. Um, and then he just carried on munching, like, you know, piss yeah. off, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm having my lad. I know when you're talking to me. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but overall, you loved Africa. And, yeah. you, and you're happy you did that instead of the moon parties. Okay. Well, you've been a great guest. I really appreciate it. And we wish you well. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Nice to chat. We hope that episode enhanced your life. We post an interview every day as well as vlogging on our social media channel. Don't forget to subscribe to get our latest episode.